The duty and actings of a believer under distress from a sense of sin, his application to God and to God alone, earnestness and intention of mind in this. The words of these two first verses declare also the deportment of the soul in the condition that we have described. That is what he does, and what course it steers for relief. I have cried unto you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. There is in the words a general application made and a tendency to relief in which is first to be considered to whom the application is made, and that is God. I have cried unto thee, Jehovah. God gave out that name to his people to confirm their faith and the stability of his promises. Exodus 3. He who is being himself will assuredly give being and subsistence to his promises. Being to deal with God about the promises of grace. He makes his application to him under this name. I call upon you, Jehovah. And the application itself may be observed first. The anthropopathy of the expression. He prays that God would cause his ears to be attentive after the manner of men who seriously attend to what is spoken to them when they turn aside from that which they don't regard. Secondly, the earnestness of the soul in the work it has in hand, which is evident both from the reduplication of his request. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications and the emphaticalness of the words he makes use of. Let your ears, he says, be diligently attentive. The word signifies the most diligent heedfulness and close attention. Let your ears be very attentive. Well, to what? To the voice of my supplications. Of my deprecations or earnest prayers for the averting of evil or punishment. But the word is to be gracious or merciful, so that it signifies properly supplication for grace. Be attentive, he says, O Lord, to my supplications for grace and mercy, which according to my extreme necessity I now address myself to make to you. And in these words the psalmist sets forth in general the frame and working of a gracious soul being cast into depths and darkness by sin. The foundation of what I shall further pursue lies in these two propositions. First, the only attempt of a sinful and tangled soul for relief lies in an application to God alone. To you, Jehovah, have I cried, Lord, hear. Secondly, depths of sin entanglements will put a gracious soul on intense and earnest applications to God. Lord, hear. Lord, attend. Dying men do not use to cry out slothfully for relief. What may be thought necessary in general for the direction of a soul in the state and condition described shall briefly be spoken to from these two propositions. One, trouble, danger, disquietment, arguing not only things evil, but a sense in the mind and soul of them, will of themselves put those in whom they are upon seeking relief. Everything would naturally be at rest. A drowning man needs no exhortation to endeavor his own deliverance and safety, and spiritual troubles will, in like manner, put men on attempts for relief. To seek for no remedy is to be senselessly obdurate or wretchedly desperate as Cain and Judas. We may suppose, then, that the principal business of every soul in depths is to endeavor deliverance. They cannot rest in that condition in which they have no rest. In this endeavor, what course a gracious soul steers is laid down in the first proposition, negatively and positively. He applies himself not to anything but God. He applies himself to God. An eminent example we have of it in both parts, or both to the one side and the other, in Hosea 14.3, Assure, say they, those poor distressed returning sinners shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. 
Their application to God is intended with a renunciation of every other way of relief. Several things there are that sinners are apt to apply themselves to for relief in their perplexities, which prove to them as waters that fail. How many things have the Romanists invented to deceive souls with? Things and angels, the Blessed Virgin, the Wood of the Cross, confessions, penances, masses, pilgrimages, dirges, purgatories, papal pardons, works of compensation, and the like, are made entrances for innumerable souls into everlasting ruin. Did they know the terror of the Lord, the nature of sin? and of the mediation of Christ, they would be ashamed and confounded in themselves for these abominations. They would not say to their idols, Ye are our gods, come and save us. How short do all their contrivances come of his that would fain be offering rivers of oil, yea, the fruit of his body for the sin of his soul, his firstborn for his transgression, Micah 6, 7, who yet gains nothing but an aggravation of his sin and misery by it. Yea, and the heathen went beyond them in devotion and expense. It is no new inquiry what course sin perplexed souls should take for relief. From the foundation of the world, the minds of far the greatest part of mankind have been exercised in it. As was their light or darkness, such was the course they took. Among those who were ignorant of God, this inquiry brought forth all that diabolical superstition which spread itself over the face of the whole world. Gentilism being destroyed by the power and efficacy of the gospel, the same inquiry working in the minds of darkened men, in conjunction with other lusts, brought forth the papacy. When men had lost a spiritual acquaintance with the covenant of grace and mystery of the gospel, the design of eternal love, and efficacy of the blood of Christ, they betook themselves in part or in whole for relief under their entanglements to the broken cisterns mentioned. They are of two sorts, self and other things. For those other things which belong to their false worship, being abominated by all the saints of God, I shall not need to make any further mention of them. That which relates to self is not confined to popery, but confines itself to the limits of human nature, and is predominant over all that are under the law. That is, to seek for relief and sin distresses by self-endeavors, self-righteousness. So many poor souls in these straits apply themselves to themselves. They expect their cure from the same hand that wounded them. This is the life of Judaism, as the Apostle informs us in Romans 10, verse 3. And all men under the law are still animated by the same principle. They return, but not to the Lord. Finding themselves in depths and distresses about sin, what course do they take? This they will do, they will do no more. This shall be their ordinary course, and that they will do in an extraordinary manner, as they have offended, so their trouble arises, so they will amend, and look that their peace should spring from this, as if God and they stood on equal terms. In this way some spend all their days sinning and amending, amending and sinning, without once coming to repentance and peace. This the soul of believers watch against. They look on themselves as fatherless, in you the fatherless finds mercy, that is, helpless, without the least ground of hopes in themselves or expectation from themselves. They know their repentance, their amendment, their supplications, their humiliations, their fastings, their mortifications will not relieve them. Repent they will and amend they will, and pray and fast and humble their souls, for they know these things to be their duty, but they know that their goodness extends not to him with whom they have to do, nor is he profited by their righteousness. They will in the performance of all duties, but they expect not deliverance by any duty. It is God, they say, with whom we have to do. Our business is to hearken what he will say to us. There are also other ways in which sinful souls destroy themselves by false reliefs. 
diversions from their perplexing thoughtfulness please them. They will fix on something or other that cannot cure their disease, but shall only make them forget that they are sick. As Cain, under the terror of his guilt, departed from the presence of the Lord, and sought inward rest and outward labor and employment. He went and built a city, Genesis 4:17. Such courses Saul fixed on, first music, then a witch. Nothing more ordinary than for men thus to deal with their convictions. They see their sickness, feel their wound, and go to the Assyrian, Hosea 5:13. And this insensibly leads men into atheism, Frequent applications of creature diversions to convictions of sin are a notable means of bringing on final impenitency. Some drunkards had, it may be, never been so, had they not been first convinced of other sins. They strove to stifle the guilt of the one sin with another sin. They fly from themselves to themselves, from their consciences to their lusts, and seek for relief from sin by sinning. This is so far from believers that they will not allow lawful things to be a diversion of their distress. Use lawful things they may and will, but not to divert their thoughts from their distresses. These they know must be issued between God and them. Where off, they will not, but must be taken away. These rocks and the like in which there are innumerable, I say, a gracious soul takes care to avoid. He knows it is God alone who is the Lord of his conscience, God alone against whom he has sinned, God alone who can pardon his sin. From dealing with him he will be neither enticed nor diverted. To you, O Lord, he says, do I come. Your word concerning me must stand. Upon you will I wait. If you have no delight in me, I must perish. Other remedies I know are vain. I intend not to spend my strength for that which is not bread. Unto you do I cry. Here a sin-entangled soul is to fix itself. Trouble excites it to look for relief. Many things without it present themselves as a diversion. Many things within it offer themselves for a remedy. Forget your sorrow, says the former. Ease yourself of it by us, says the latter. The soul refuses both, as physicians of no value, and to God alone makes its application. He has wounded, and he alone can heal. And until anyone that is sensible of the guilt of sin will come off from all reserves to deal immediately with God, it is in vain for him to expect relief. Number two, herein it is intense earnest and urgent, which was the second thing observed. It is no time now to be slothful. The soul's all. Its greatest concerns are at stake. Dull, cold, formal, customary applications to God will not serve the turn. Ordinary actings of faith, love, and fervency, usual seasons, opportunities, and duties answer not this condition. To do no more than ordinary now is to do nothing at all. He that puts forth no more strength and activity for his deliverance when he is in depths, ready to perish, than he does or has need to do when he is at liberty in plain and smooth paths, is scarcely like to escape. Some in such conditions are careless and negligent. They think an ordinary course to wear off their distempers, and that, Although at present they are sensible of their danger, they shall yet have peace at last, in which frame there is much contempt of God. Some despond and languish away under their pressures. Spiritual sloth influences both these sorts of persons. Let us see the frame under consideration exemplified in another. We have an example in the spouse, in the Song of Solomon 3, 1 to 3. She had lost the presence of Christ, and so was in the very state and condition before described. Verse 1. It was night with her, a time of darkness and disconsolation, and she seeks for her beloved. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loves. Christ is absent from her, and she was left to depths and darkness upon that account. Therefore she seeks for him. 
but is the most are apt to do in the like state and condition. She mends not her pace. She doesn't go out or beyond her course of ordinary duties, nor the frame she was usually in at other times. But what is the issue? She says, I did not find him, or I found him not. This is not a way to recover a sense of lost love, nor to get out of her entanglements. This puts her on another course. She begins to think that if things continue in this state, she'll be undone. I go on indeed with the performance of duty still, but I have not the presence of my beloved. I don't meet with Christ in them. My darkness and trouble abide still. If I take not some other course, I shall be lost. Well, she says, I will rise now, verse 2. I will shake off all that ease and sloth and customariness that cleave to me. Some more lively, vigorous course must be fixed on. Resolutions for new, extraordinary, vigorous, constant applications to God are the first general step and degree of a sin-entangled soul acting towards a recovery. I will rise now. And what does she do when she is thus resolved? I will, she says, go about the streets and in the broad ways and seek him whom my soul loves. I will leave no ways or means unattempted in which I may possibly come to a fresh enjoyment of him. If a man seek for a friend, he can look for him only in the streets and in the broad ways, that is, either in towns or in the fields. So will I do, saith the spouse. In what way, ordinance, or institution soever, whatever duty, public or private, of communion with others, or solitary retiredness, Christ ever was or may be found, or peace obtained, I will seek him, and not give over until I come to an enjoyment of him. And this frame, this resolution, a soul in depths must come to, if ever it expect deliverance. For the most part, men's wounds stink and are corrupt because of their foolishness. As the psalmist complains in Psalm 38, verse 5, They are wounded by sin, and through spiritual sloth they neglect their cure. This weakens them and disquiets them day by day. Yet they endure all rather than they will come out of their carnal ease to deal effectually with God in an extraordinary manner. It was otherwise with David. In Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, why, he says, are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime and in the night season, and am not silent. What ails the man? Can he not be quiet night nor day? Never silent? Never hold his peace? And if he be somewhat disquieted, can he not contain himself, but that he must roar and cry out? Yea, must he roar thus all the day long, as he speaks in Psalm 32, verse 3, and groan all the night, as Psalm 6, verse 6. What is the matter with all this roaring, sighing, tears, roaring all the day, all night long? Ah, let him alone, his soul is bitter in him. He has fallen into depths, the Lord has withdrawn from him. Trouble is at hand. Yea, he is full of anxiety on the account of sin. There is no quietness and soundness in him, and he must thus earnestly and restlessly apply himself for relief. Alas, what strangers for the most part are men nowadays to this frame. How little of the workings of the Spirit is found amongst us, and is not the reason of it that we value the world more, and heaven and heavenly things less than he did? that we can live at a better rate without a sense of the love of God in Christ and he could do? And is it not hence that we every day see so many withering professors that have in a manner lost all communion with God, beyond a little lip labor or talking, the filthy savor of whose wounds are offensive to all but themselves? And so will they go on, ready to die and perish, rather than with this holy man thus stir up themselves to meet the Lord. Haman was also like to him. Psalm 88, verse 11 and 12. What sense he had of his depths, he declares in verse 3. My soul, he says, is full of troubles, and my life draws near unto the grave. 
and what course doth he steer in this heavy, sorrowful, and disconsolate condition? Why, he says, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear unto my cry. Verses 1 and 2. Day and night he cries to the God of his salvation, and that with earnestness and importunity. This is his business. This was he exercised about all his days. This is that which is aimed at. If a gracious soul be brought into the depths before mentioned and described by reason of sin, when the Lord is pleased to lead him forth towards a recovery, he causes him to be vigorous and restless in all the duties in which he may make application to him for deliverance. Now, wherein this intenseness and earnestness of the soul in its applications to God principally consists, I shall briefly declare when I have touched a little upon some considerations and grounds that stir it up to this. 1. The greatest of men's concerns may well put them on this earnestness. Men do not use to deal with dull and slothful spirits about their great concerns. David tells us that he was more concerned in the light of God's countenance than the men of the world would be in their corn and wine. Psalm 6, 6 and 7. Suppose a man of the world should have his house in which all his stock and riches are laid up, set on fire, and so the whole be in danger under his eye to be consumed, would he be calm and quiet in the consideration of it? Would he not bestir himself with all his might and call in all the help he could obtain? and that because his portion, his all, his great concern lies at stake. And shall the soul be slothful, careless, dull, secure, when fire is put to its eternal concerns, when the light of God's countenance, which is of more esteem to him than the greatest increase of corn and wine can be to the men of the world, is removed from him? It was an argument of prodigious security in Jonah, who was fast asleep in the ship in which he was ready to be cast away for his sake. And will it be thought less than any soul who, being in a storm of wrath and displeasure from God, sent out into the deep after him, shall neglect it and sleep, as Solomon says, on the top of a mast in the midst of the sea? How did that poor creature whose heart was mad on his idols, Judges 18.24, cry out when he was deprived of them? You have taken away my gods, he says, and what have I more? And shall a gracious soul lose his God through his own folly, the sense of his love, the consolation of his presence, and not with all his might follow hard after him? Peace with God. Joy in believing such souls have formably obtained. Can they live without them now in their ordinary walking? Can they choose but cry out with Job, Oh, that it were with us as in former days, when the candle of the Lord was upon our tabernacle? Chapter 29, 2-4 And with David, O oh God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Psalm fifty one twelve. For, O oh my God, I remember former enjoyments, and my soul is cast down within me. Psalm 13, verse 6, they cannot live without it. But suppose they might make a sorry shift to pass on in their pilgrimage, while all is smooth about them. What will they do in a time of outward trials and distresses, when deep calls to deep, and one trouble excites and sharpens another? Nothing then will support them, they know, but that which is lacking to them is Habakkuk 3, verses 17 and 18. Psalm 23, verse 4, that the greatness of their concern provokes them to the earnestness mentioned. Number two, they have a deep sense of these, their great concerns. All men are equally concerned in the love of God and pardon of sin. Everyone has a soul of the same immortal constitution, equally capable of bliss and woe. But yet we see most men are so stupidly sottish that they take little notice of these things. Neither the guilt of sin, nor the wrath of God, nor death, nor hell are thought on or esteemed by them. They are their concerns, but they are not sensible of them. But gracious souls have a quick, living sense of spiritual things. For first, they have a saving spiritual light, in which they are able to discern the true nature of sin and the terror of the Lord. For though they are now supposed to have lost the comforting light of the Spirit, yet they never lose 
sanctifying light of the Spirit, the light in which they are enabled to discern spiritual things in a spiritual manner. This never utterly departs from them. By this they see sin to be exceeding sinful. By this they know the terror of the Lord, Second Corinthians 5.11, and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10.31. By this they discover the excellency of the love of God in Christ, which passes knowledge, the present sense whereof they have lost. By this they are enabled to look within the veil, and to take a view of the blessed consolations which the saints enjoy, whose communion with God was never interrupted. This represents to them all the sweetness, pleasure, joy, and peace which in former days they had, while God was present with them in love. By this, they are taught to value all the fruits of the blood of Jesus Christ, of the enjoyment of many, which at present they are cut short and deprived, which with other things of the like nature and importance make them very sensible of their concerns. Secondly, they remember what it cost them formerly to deal with God about sin, and hence they know it is no ordinary matter they have in hand. They must again to their old work, take the old cup into their hands again, a recovery from depth is as the new conversion. Oftentimes in it, the whole work as to the soul's apprehension has gone over afresh. This the soul knows to have been a work of dread, terror, and trouble, and trembles in itself at its new trials. And thirdly, the Holy Ghost gives to poor souls a fresh sense of their deep concerns, on purpose, that it may be a means to stir them up, to these earnest applications to God. The whole work is his, and he carries it on by means suited to the compassing of the end he aims at. And by these means is a gracious soul brought into the frame mentioned. Now, there are a number of things that concur in and unto this frame. First, there is a continual thoughtfulness about the sad condition in which the soul is in its depths. Being deeply affected with their condition, they are continually ruminating upon it and pondering it in their minds. So David declares the ease to have been with him. Psalm 38, 2-6 and 8 Your arrow stick fast in me, and your hand presses me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Restlessness. Deep thoughtfulness. Disquietness of heart. Continual heaviness of soul. Sorrow and anxiety of mind is at the bottom of the applications we speak of. From these principles, their prayers flow out, as David adds in verse 9, Lord, all my desires before you, and my groaning is not hid from you. This way, all his trouble wrought. He prayed out of the abundance of his meditation and grief. Thoughts of their state and condition on with such persons and rise with them and accompany them all the day long. As Reuben cried, the child is not... And whither shall I go? So does such a soul. The love of God is not. Christ is not. Death is near at hand. Relief is far away. Darkness is about me. I have lost my peace, my joy, my song in the night. What do I think of duties? Can two walk together unless they be agreed? Can I walk with God in them while I have thus made him mine enemy? What do I think of ordinances? Will it do me any good to be at Jerusalem and not see the face of the king? Live under ordinances and not to meet in them with the king of saints. May I not justly fear that the Lord will take his Holy Spirit from me until I be left without remedy. With such thoughts as these are sin entangled souls exercised, and they are rolling in their minds in all their applications to God. Secondly, we see the application itself consists in and is made by the prayer of faith are crying to God. Now this is done with intenseness of mind, which hath a twofold fruit of propriety. First, importunity, and secondly, constancy. 
It is said of our blessed Savior that when he was in the depths about our sins, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears, Hebrews 5, 7. Strong cries and tears express the utmost intention of spirit. And David expresses it by roaring, as we have seen before, as also by sighing, groaning, and panting. A soul in such a condition lies down before the Lord with sighs, groans, mourning cries, tears, and roaring, according to the various working of his heart, and is being affected with the things that it has to do. And this produces first importunity, the power of the importunity of faith our Savior has marvelously set out. Luke eleven five to ten is also chapter eighteen verse one. Importunate prayer is certainly prevailing, and importunity is, as it were, made up of these two things frequency of interposition and variety of arguings. You shall have a man that is importunate come to you seven times a day about the same business, and after all if any new thought come into his mind, though he had resolved to the contrary, he will come again. And there is nothing that can be imagined to relate to the business he has in hand, but he will make use of it, and turn it to the furtherance of his plea. So is it in this case. Men will use both frequency of interposition and variety of arguments. Psalm 86, 3, I cry to you daily, or rather all the day, but that one business, and he attended to it to the purpose. By this means we give God no rest which is the very character of importunity. Such souls go to God, and they are not satisfied with what they have done, and they go again. And someone abides still with them, and they go to him again. And the heart is not yet empty, they will go to him, that he may have no rest. What variety of arguments are pleaded with God in this case, I can manifest in the same David, but it is known to all. There is not anything almost that he makes not a plea of. The faithfulness, righteousness, name, mercy, goodness, and kindness of God in Jesus Christ, the concern of others in him, both the friends and foes of God, his own weakness and helplessness, yea, the greatness of sin itself. Be merciful to my sin, he says, for it is great. Sometimes he begins with some arguments of this kind, and then, being a little diverted by other considerations, some new plea is suggested to him by the Spirit and he returns immediately to his first employment and design, all arguing, great intention of mind and spirit. Secondly, constancy also flows from intenseness. Such a soul will not give over until it obtained what it aims at and looks for, as we shall see in our process in opening this psalm. And this, in, in general, the deportment of a gracious soul in the condition here represented to us, as poor creatures love their peace. As they love their souls, as they tender the glory of God, they are not to be lacking in this duty. What is the reason that controversies hang so long between God and your souls that it may be you scarce see a good day all your lives? Is it not for the most part from your sloth and despondency of spirit? You will not gird up the loins of your minds in dealing with God to put them to a speedy issue in the blood of Christ. You go on and off, begin and cease, Try and give over, and for the most part, though your case be extraordinary, content yourselves with ordinary and customary applications to God. This makes you wither, become useless, and pine away in and under your perplexities. David did not so, but after many and many a breach made by sin, yet through quick, vigorous, restless actings of faith, all was repaired so that he lived peaceably and died triumphantly. Up, then, and be doing. Let not your wounds corrupt because of your folly. Make thorough work of that which lies before you, be it long or difficult. It is all one. It must be done. And is attended with safety. What you were like to meet with in the first place shall next be declared.